Hello, fellow developers. I'm Danny, a software engineer from SRE team, or Site Reliability Engineering team, here at Line Taiwan. Well, as you guys know, Kubernetes is uh, taking over the world right now, and we at Line Taiwan are also actively adopting it and its ecosystem. And as team got more and more into Kubernetes, uh, issues started to appear and things got more complex. Today, I'm going to share with you how GitOps, which is managing Kubernetes clusters through the use of Git, uh, help teams adopt Kubernetes here at Line Taiwan. Um, so, but be before we begin though, uh, let's fast forward a little bit to talk about the current status. Uh, by October 2020, we have more than 20 projects managing over 50 Kubernetes clusters and 130 plus applications configurations using GitOps. And pretty much all projects and services Align Taiwan are aboard already, including some of the more well known services like Line Today, Line Shopping, Line Music, Line Hub, Line Travel, and also Line Spot. Okay, now you all know about the current status, we can get back to where we started and talk a little bit about infrastructure modernization. Uh, so it all began with the emerge of cloud native applications, which mainly consist of three main ideas, uh, microservices, containers, and also DevOps. At Line Taiwan, we are always looking for better ways to develop better applications and release them, releasing them faster to the market while bringing better user experiences at the same time. By breaking down the traditional monolith architecture, where the entire application is deployed as a whole into microservices, development velocity increased and complexity of each microservice can be better controlled. Uh, different parts of the application can be deployed and scaled independently using containers. DevOps practices help us achieve short development lifecycle and continuous delivery. As we embrace cloud native here at Line Taiwan, our infrastructure quickly started to show its age. Um, there are three main things that we look forward to solving uh, by modernization, modernizing our infrastructure, uh, which are portability, uh, developer onboarding experience, and also the scalability. Uh, before modernization, running applications on different environments uh, consists of a, step, a series of, uh, of steps. Uh, the server needs to be set up in a certain way, uh, run a certain operating system, have a specific set of dependencies installed, uh, environment variables and settings tweaked, and other moving parts handled before application could start running normally. And the worst part is, most of the aforementioned steps uh, were usually performed manually by a developer or an operator. Uh, so this whole process is error prone and time consuming. Uh, with microservices, um, they are developed with different programming languages and also requiring different sets of dependencies. Uh, this gets even worse uh, as in the procedures will need to be repeated for each of the microservices. Uh, by leveraging containers and packaging applications into container images, each microservice becomes a self-contained, ready-to-be-deployed unit. And the only dependency needed to run these images is Docker, the uh, container runtime of our choice. Um, here, developer onboarding means the time and cost for a new developer to get up to speed. Uh, since most of our applications with microservices are designed with a sophisticated architecture, it usually takes days, if not weeks, for a developer just to get a development environment set up with everything good to go. Not to mention that most of the time, the team would need, also need uh, to dedicate an existing developer to help the newcomer to get familiar with the setup as there would most likely uh, be hidden steps or tricks, uh, which mostly are like usually undocumented to get everything running correctly. Uh, with containers and a set of Kubernetes manifests, a new developer only needs to create a Kubernetes cluster on its local machine and apply Kubernetes manifest to it. And next thing you know, it's boom, the entire application stack just start running on your dev machine. The whole process takes a matter of minutes instead of days or weeks. At Line Taiwan, most of our services are usually 
confronted with large amounts of traffic. Therefore, we would like、uh, our applications to be as scalable as possible. Scaling vir- virtual machines is definitely no fun.、Uh, they take a while to boot, and running applications loosely on virtual machines is just not cost effective.、Uh, to work around these problems,、uh, we would need like more virtual machines to be provisioned that we、uh, actually need it.、Uh, this causes low utilization of our resources. By using uh, containers, <coughs> sorry.、Uh, by using containers,、uh, our applications become incredibly easy to run and scale.、Uh, containers can be created almost instantly and started in a few seconds. A node, whether it's virtual or bare metal, becomes just a group of resources that can be subdivided into containers, and this allows better use of all available resources. More applications can actually fit and run on a node now. Uh, so Kubernetes is at the center of our infrastructure modernization process.、Uh, we started our Kubernetes Kubernetesization process at the beginning of year 2018,、uh, which was about two years from now. Well, due to const-、uh, resource constraints at that time, we decided to go for the、uh, one cluster for all approach,、uh, which is we built one single large cluster that will be shared by all the services in Taiwan. And、by using this approach,、uh, we can minimize the overhead of managing multiple clusters. However, we do have separate clusters set up for、uh, development, staging, and production environments. In order to reduce the blast radius when things go wrong, so development and staging environments wouldn't affect the services running in production, our Kubernetes clusters were actually provisioned and managed using a really well-known open, so- open source solution called Rancher. Kubernetes and Rancher actually supported this kind of multi-tenant setup fairly well. We use Kubernetes namespaces and Rancher projects to isolate projects and services from each other.、Um, by the end of year 2019, our shared cluster had over 35 namespaces with over 100 nodes and over 3,500 pods. It really seemed like a successful attempt in infrastructure modernization. Our services are all containerized and orchestrated using Kubernetes. So far, so good. Well, however, things were weren't exactly as smooth as one would think.、Uh, over the course of two years, while we gradually adopt Kubernetes, we st- still face several challenges. Here are six major challenges、uh, that we face while adopting Kubernetes. Uh, they are a lack of awareness of Kubernetes, limited Kubernetes knowledge, needs for developer tooling, configuration and manifest management, arbitrary cluster man- manipulations, and lack of best practices.、Uh, since Rancher was used to manage our shared clusters,、uh, users were allowed to log in into the Rancher UI using their LZAP credentials. Most teams just use Rancher UI to deploy workloads,、uh, set up configurations, importing certificates,、uh, streaming logs, and logging into containers. All of these using the Rancher's amazingly built UI. A lot of users、uh, literally thought Rancher is some sort of platform as a service that we rolled out to become the new way to run their applications without setting up servers themselves. Migrate to Rancher from VMs or、uh, deploy new versions to Rancher or run new applications on Rancher were how the, the team communicate back then. So Rancher is actually kind of a service where a developer run their applications on. Well, Rancher is so well built and complete that some of the users didn't even aware that they were using Kubernetes underneath Rancher. Uh, the screenshot to the right shows how Rancher shows a list of workloads and their status, and this screen is how user can directly ma- configure like everything about a deployment, such as like what ports to publish and also like、uh, what environment variable values to be set.、Uh, because our users thought they were using Rancher instead of Kubernetes, most of them have limited Kubernetes knowledge. Uh, this eventually became a problem as we have more teams on board as issues would occur as as the longer the application run. 
users are uh, users often just report errors by copy pasting the messages shown on the Ranger UI to us, and and it was like really hard to communicate because the lack of even some of the most basic Kubernetes concepts. Uh, it eventually turned into a guests and check affair, which uh, we work with users on troubleshooting, and it's really, really time consuming. Okay, so um, VKS, our in-house managed Kubernetes service, which was actually also being developed while we had our shared cluster running. Uh, we actually worked with the VKS team since the beginning. And by the beginning of the year 2020, we concluded that VKS was ready for, for production use and decided to ask the teams at Taiwan to migrate off from our shared cluster and move on to VKS. Well, part of this discussion was due to the limited resource we had for maintaining the shared cluster. And another part is simply we want our teams to actually uh, use Kubernetes directly. Uh, this allows the team to have a better understanding of how the entire system works. So uh, we also changed uh, from the one cluster for all approach to multiple cluster on cluster, um, project on clusters. Since it was uh, very simple to create a new cluster in VKS. So as developers started to use plain Kubernetes to operate their clusters, the need for tools that work just like Rancher surfaced. Rancher was not only used by developers. Uh, QAs use Rancher to monitor workload metrics, and even non-technical members can use it to observe the status of their services and to know like, the health, healthiness of their services. Uh, for those of you who are familiar, familiar with Rancher, you might be thinking that uh, why not just let teams set up their own Rancher instances and import their VKS clusters into the Rancher so they can keep all the benefits of using Rancher. Unfortunately, this won't ha happen because uh, importing VKS cluster into Rancher will interfere with the inner workings of the VKS platform. That's why um, we couldn't use uh, Rancher to manage our VKS clusters. As users started to use YAML files to manage the Kubernetes manifest and configuration files, uh, these questions were often asked. Uh, where should we store our YAML files? How should we handle configuration changes? And what is the best way to set up across uh, access control of these files? Should all the members ac across the team be able to change these files, or only a certain people are granted with the permission? Also, teams started to find arbitrary cluster manipulation become an issue. Due to the design of VKS, obtaining cube configs with cluster admin role was actually very easy and direct. So uh, direct cluster manipulation through kube cuddle becomes dangerous because there's basically nothing to stop you from doing anything you want and also anything you don't want. So it is also very difficult to track changes made to the Kubernetes cluster and the objects if they were manipulated directly by kube cuddle. Also, the lack of best practices. Another problem is the lack of best practices. Kubernetes is very flexible by design, and this can be a double-edged sword because every task can be done in so many different ways. At Line Taiwan, we want to have predictable behaviors across all of our clusters. So some best practices can definitely help here, such as uh, what ingress controller to, to choose, uh, how do we approach resource and capacity planning, and also how do we observe and monitor status of our applications to ensure they are healthy. So all in all, in order to solve these challenges we had mentioned above, uh, the SRE team at Line Taiwan started to look for solutions, and then we finally landed on GitOps. So GitOps, um, let's first talk a little bit about the concept of GitOps, and then we'll talk about how we implement GitOps alongside with other practices here at Line Taiwan. Here are some of the benefits of GitHub that finally made us decide to implement here at Line Taiwan, including a single source of truth, developer friendliness, and minimal direct manip manipulations. Uh, remember the question about where to store YAML files? GitHub manages this by having a single source of truth for all the YAML files. By using a Git repository as a single source of truth, 
and storing all the YAML files inside, we now have one place to go to. So what are these YAML files anyway? They are actually declarative configuration for Kubernetes, which store the desired states of how the application should run. Uh, Kubernetes use these manifests or Kubernetes objects to run and configure your applications. The directory structure to the left is an example of how the Git repository is used with GitOps. You can see all the different YAML files are listed uh, inside the repository and are uh, organized into different folders. Uh, GitHub is very developer friendly. As all the configuration are stored inside a Git repository, developers can manage them by using workflows. They're already familiar with such as pull requests and uh, code reviews. And since all changes are tracked by Git, the Git history automatically becomes the change log of your Kubernetes clusters. Uh, from the screenshot to the right, uh, the team now can clearly track each deployment and configuration change and know exactly who committed the change along with whose approval. It is all just second nature to developers. Another huge benefit of GitHub is how it can minimize direct cluster manip manipulations. As all configurations are now stored in our single source of truth, the cluster state is just a representation of the Git repository itself. Uh, in order to change what's running on the cluster, all you need to do now is to change what's configured inside the repository. Um, this provides a safer manner of changing uh, what's running on your clusters. Uh, one of the key elements to get up is an agent that's continuously running in the background to automatically sync changes from your Git repo to your clusters. This agent will replace the need of direct kubectl commands in most cases. Uh, now your cluster changes are managed, reviewed, and propagated automatically in a more systematic fa fashion. This diagram shows the overall picture of GitOps. So now developer can request changes to the cluster by creating pull requests, and after the PRs are reviewed and approved by other developers, they are merged. Up to this point, which is uh, to the left of the dotted line, uh, on the diagram is handled all by using the developer's familiar workflow on GitHub. After the changes are merged, the sync agent will pull the latest manifest and automatically apply the new manifest to the corresponding cluster. Another responsibility of the sync agent is to notify if there's any difference between the live cluster state and desired state stored in the single source of truth, so developers can easily sync back to the desired state if they wish. So now you know the basic concepts of GitOps and what benefits it brings. Let's take a look at how we implement GitOps at Line Taiwan. We implement uh, GitOps by using two important tools and other common practices built around these tools. Uh, we'll talk about each of them one by one now. Uh, the first one and perhaps the most important tool is Argo CD. This is an open source project that describes itself as declarative continuous delivery for Kubernetes. Remember the sync agent we talked about in the GitHub's diagram? Uh, Argo CD takes that role and does so much more than that. Coming from Rancher, we all know how important it is for our teams to have an easily accessible web interface for managing applications. Argo CD has a web UI that can let developers follow the syncing process, describe any Kubernetes cloud Kubernetes object they want, and even stream logs from the pods inside the UI. <clears throat> the UI also has an intuitive um, feature for live comparison between the desired states and the live states. This is a screenshot of Argo CD's dashboard. Here we can see at a glance about all the applications deployed and managed using Argo CD. It provides a quick way to know how our application is doing currently and provides some quick action buttons such as uh, sync the desired state back to the cluster. And if we click on one of the applications, it then brings us to its application view. Argo CD tries to show all the Kubernetes objects you configured uh, with relationships between them if possible. 
For some of the objects, it also show the status and health, so you don't need to click through each one of them to find out. This view is also how you get all the detailed information about each object in your cluster, such as getting their current YAML and streaming their latest logs. This screen shows how Argo CD displays uh, the diffs between uh, the live states and the desired states. A uh, live state is to the left and uh, the de desired state is to the right. Um, so it displays just like uh, how you expect from a diff viewer, like on GitHub or any other um, Git client. And so developers can immediately know that uh, the live state has drifted. Well, and then syncing back, the desired state is also just one button click away. <clears throat> so let's take a look at this diagram again from our GitHub's and put Argo CD inside the picture, uh, which is the sync agent. Repository can also notify Argo CD uh, about the manifest and configuration changes through webhook instead of letting uh, Argo CD pull uh, continuously in the background. So Argo CD can begin its work of syncing almost immediately. Next up is customize. Uh, in most cases, we'll have like multiple environments of our applications deployed and customize can help us overlay the specific settings uh, for each environment while keeping a common configuration base. Customize double itself as Kubernetes native configuration management. So um, it basically just use plain and template free YAML files to do all the configurations and patches. And it is supported natively by Argo CD. And it is also encouraged uh, using customize with GitOps. So um, you can, the, the developers can more easily uh, like change and manage their manifests. Uh, without uh, having a lot of duplicate files. So here is a diagram showing how customize works. Uh, it, we divide the diagram into uh, three parts. Let's, a look, let, let's take a look at the left part, left hand part first. Uh, so a uh, developer will first define the base configuration, uh, which consists of uh, different manifests, and you create a file called customization.yaml. And this file will reference all the manifests uh, you listed as base. And in the middle, you'll create one overlay for each uh, environment you're trying to deploy. Uh, so in each overlay, uh, first of all, you still create a customization.yaml file. And then that YAML file will reference the base customization YAML file. So all the configuration you stated in base get automatic, automatically copied to your overlay. And then the overlay customization will over reference some uh, specific patches to the specific environment of that overlay. So uh, like in dev environments, you can use overlay and patches to patch uh, specific like variables to use in dev environments. And when you feed the overlay to customize and do its build process, uh, uh, once customized start building, uh, it will pull the overlay first and see which uh, resources it's referencing to, including the base resources, and apply the patches on top of it. And then it'll generate an output looks like uh, the one on the right hand side, which include a complete YAML files with specific patches applied onto it. All right, so let's take a look at a, a real example of how customized work in practice. So at the left hand side, you can see there's a base YAML file, which uh, is just a simple Kubernetes de de deployment. So in this deployment, we actually like list out how many replicas we want to run and what images we want to run and other specific uh, configurations. So this configuration can actually be shared across all of our environments. So these uh, configuration here are common across all of our environments. Uh, next, in the center part is our overlay. So in the overlay, this is actually uh, a patch and it's specified like um, the environment variable we want to put inside our production environment. So, and also we want to run more replicas 
inside our production environment. So uh, after having these two files uh, defined, we can then write our customization. So as you can see in our customization file, first we reference our base into our resource section. And in our patch section, we reference our patch file inside our overlay. So after we run customized build through, uh, <clears throat> through uh, after we run customized build with uh, those two files, this is the generated YAML output. So this is the final deployment and how it looked like. Now take a look at how customize actually apply the replica count and also the environment variables into the deployment itself. And all of these happen without using any specific templating tools like Helm or other templating languages. Everything is just done in plain YAML. All right, so back to our GitHub's diagram. This is, um, uh, we'll try to fit in customize here. So uh, where is customize actually run inside this diagram? Customize actually run on, in, uh, I'm sorry. Customize actually run in Argo CD. So Argo CD will uh, receive a webhook from your Git repository, and then it will uh, grab grab all the manifests inside your repository, and then call it customize build to build the overlays, and then it will build the entire manifest in one file, and later on apply that manifest to your live running Kubernetes cluster. Now. Uh, other than these uh, important tools, we also have some other practices set up, such as we have standardized common apps. Uh, all clusters need to have some common infrastructure set up. So like uh, how, how can the traffic reach the cluster? Uh, we probably need to have some ingress controller set up. So uh, instead of letting each project to decide on their own technology stack and which ingress controller to use, uh, we have set up a specific standardized uh, a set of components such as ingress controllers and also observability agents, lo logging clients, and things like that. Uh, so each team still need to spend more time to configure and figure out like which tra uh, which ingress controller works the best. <clears throat> they can all reference uh, the standardized common apps from a single repository and reuse those apps across different clusters. This is an example of a customization that's referencing the uh, standardized apps. Uh, inside the resources section, you can see that uh, it's actually referencing a remote uh, customization file. So uh, customization, a uh, customized can not only use uh, Customization store locally, but you can also use customization from remote site, such as a Git repository or any uh, remote network locations where a customize support it. Uh, so here we listed uh, two different bases using a uh, Git protocol. So we actually pulled in a standardized traffic tool, which is a, a ingress controller, and also we pulled in a OBS agent, which is our observability agent, uh, which used to uh, monitor and track matrices and also logs for all of our, our applications. All right, so all in all, uh, this is how uh, GitOps combined with Kubernetes look like. And this is the uh, basic overall workflow. So the team who's trying to use GitOps with uh, Kubernetes will first need to containerize all of their applications or all of their microservices. Well, these uh, these uh, packaging uh, process is called containerization. And after they're all containerized, uh, they can be deployed to Kubernetes. But before that, uh, teams will need to start writing a base config for all of their applications, of their application stack. So their microservices, uh, each of them will have like deployment set up and also will have uh, service and other Kubernetes objects set up to reference them. So all of these form a base config. So once the base config is set up and written, uh, teams will have overlay set up also. So 
uh, overlays are used for different environments. So uh, some teams will maybe have um, two environments such as staging and production, and some other teams will probably have more environments such as uh, dev environment, uh, environment for QA, and also RC staging and production. So depending on each team's uh, needs, they can configure however many overlays they want. So after they have overlays and base set up in their Git repository, which is the single source of truth of their Kubernetes configuration, they can sync it by setting up a application config inside Argo CD and reference the uh, Git repository to uh, inside that application config. And, uh, Git, uh, and Argo CD will just sync all the changes later on from, from this point on. All right, so pull it all together. This is a diagram showing the same thing. So let's go through it again. So developer create pull requests to uh, request configuration changes to the Kubernetes cluster. And other developers in the same team will uh, look at the pull request and do a code review to make sure uh, everything inside the manifest is actually working and nothing is uh, looking weird. And after that, the developer approves the pull request and the pull request got merged into the config repository. And uh, after the, uh, the, the uh, pull request got merged, our, uh, the GitHub will actually send a webhook to Argo CD. So when Argo CD received the webhook request, it, it acts kind of like a notification to Argo CD. And Argo CD will, will know that, oh, there's like more new changes to the manifest. So it will uh, clone the repository again and pull in the latest changes and then call customize build to build the latest um, configuration by applying the overlay to top, on top of base configuration. After you get the complete uh, configuration, Argo CD will then sync, which is calling kubectl apply uh, and apply that manifest to your running cluster. So this is like the entire picture of how GitOps in Line Taiwan works. So, so alongside with GitOps, we also push for other common practices, uh, such as uh, teams should create separate read-only accounts for daily use. So um, uh, yeah, developers sometimes uh, wanted to use kubectl to like observe individual cluster states and object states. So uh, we still enable them to use that, but not using the cluster main kube configs. And we, we, we encourage each team to use uh, specific usage in kube configs to let developers to do specific things since kubectl doesn't have a uh, safety guard across like whether or not you can do kubectl delete or kubectl edit different objects. So by setting up uh, pr different permissions and roles using Kubernetes RBAC system, we can achieve that. All right, so back to the challenges. Now we can take a look at how we solve all these challenges by adopting, um, for, uh, of adopting Kubernetes, by adopting uh, GitOps and other common practices we stated above. So first challenge is lack of awareness of Kubernetes. So, um, and the, the, the second one is limited Kubernetes knowledge. So for these two challenges, basically it was due to the developers are actually not aware of they're using Kubernetes underneath of Rancher. So by introducing VKS to the stack and also uh, kind of forcing or pushing the developers and teams to start using Kubernetes directly, we kind of solve these together. And after teams got started to use uh, uh, started to use Kubernetes directly, so the needs for developer tooling arise. And so we introduced GitOps and related tooling such as Argo CD and Customize to help developers and also non-developers to have a better picture of what's running and how's the application running inside their Kubernetes clusters. And this challenge of configuration and manifest management is solved by having using the a Git repository as a single source of truth. So uh, using, uh, uh, and uh, in addition to using Git repository as a single source of truth, we also use Customize to apply different configuration for different environments while uh, not having to replicate or duplicate each of the YAML files manually. 
and how do we uh, solve arbitrary cluster manipulations. Uh, we stop developers from uh, using kubectl and applying changes on their own machines or arbitrary locations. Instead, uh, we have uh, read-only configs, read-only cube configs for uh, developer machines, and we only sync changes back to the live cluster, uh, strictly using RLCD. So, in that way, all the changes to cluster are actually tracked, and who changed what is easily seen inside the Git history. And lack of best practices, uh, we start to provide uh, standardized common apps inside a repository where we just uh, configure what we think is the most appropriate way to run uh, the infrastructure and components inside all the clusters. And also, we try to implement the industry-wide best practices uh, to our teams and also teach them how to use them alongside their Kubernetes clusters. All right. so. Uh, so we're not done yet. Here are some of our next steps we can do in order to better improve our developer experience on using Kubernetes. So first, we can probably uh, automate the new cluster onboarding process. Right now, it's uh, usually uh, done manually by uh, developers from each team will, su uh, will submit a Kubernetes uh, configuration to the cluster, and then and then SRE will set up the rest. And then. Um, um, we can also, since it's only a Git repository, so we can set up like uh, a CI pipeline for it. And inside that CI pipeline, we can do all sorts of things, such as uh, YAML validation and also Kubernetes object validation. So uh, since code review sometimes go through quickly, so sometimes uh, developers cannot catch some like small mistakes, we can use automatic process to catch that. Also, we can enforce some uh, manifest policies, such as uh, when you pull image, you don't use always pull to pull the images. You need to use the if not present and some other policies, like you need to have all, <clears throat> all of your pods and deployments need to have a resource requests and limit sets in them and things like that. So we think these will be like uh, provide more help to the teams. All right. So that concludes my sharing. Thank you so much for your time and hope you enjoyed it. Thanks.